Welcome to our uh, third seminar of the EAU Commission on the Local Universe. And uh, today, uh, probably uh, our colleagues from Ukraine will not be able to join, but uh, we are recording our seminars and uh, put to the special uh, YouTube channel, and uh, they will be able uh, to hear news uh, of in science, what is going in understanding uh, our galaxy, uh, if we uh, will remain alive, of course. So I um, welcome uh, today our uh, speaker, uh, Ricardo Schiavon from the Liverpool John Moore University. And uh, he has a really very large experience and we will be glad to, to hear you, Ricardo. Could you please share your screen? Yep. Okay. I will start when you tell me to do so. Yes, please. Okay, good. So thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here talking to you uh, today about uh, uh, the work that my team has been uh, pursuing in Liverpool. Um, so the focus of the talk is going to be the inner halo of the Milky Way. Um, and uh, I'm acknowledging here the main sources of data that this work is based upon, in particular the EcoG survey, the Gaia satellite, and the Eagle project, the simulations from the Eagle, the cosmological American simulations from Eagle. All right, so this work would not be possible without the, the, the active participation of a very large number of people, in particular the Apogee team, our colleagues in Liverpool, and I want to highlight here grad students from Liverpool who have been playing an active role in this work. Okay, um, right, so I will give you the conclusions of the talk right away, so the, the points that I want you to take home. Uh, um, uh, so, so that you have that those in mind as I uh, elaborate here on uh, what we've been doing. So uh, the first thing that I want you to understand is that the inner halo of the Milky Way is a key frontier in our understanding of the galactic archaeology of the history of the Milky Way, particularly the early history of the Milky Way. Uh, um, the second point I want you to, to, to take home is that Apogee uh, has led to two fundamental two fundamental discoveries about the inner halo, right? Uh, um, and uh, uh, because it was the first um, multiplexing near infrared spectros spectroscopic uh, uh, survey, and uh, it has led to that discoveries because of that. Uh, but we are still scratching the surface. There's a lot more coming, in particular, we pay attention to upcoming big projects in the same direction, such as moons and MSC. And finally, I want you to also uh, keep in mind that the Milky Way may be an unusual galaxy. Okay. All right. So, um, first contents of the talk, uh, um, the you know the. I want you to first. Uh, 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 I'll start talking about the, the 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 purpose of galactic archaeology, the raison d'être of galactic archaeology. Then I will uh, motivate why we have to study the halo, and in particular the inner halo, briefly describe Apogee, then go into the two discoveries that we have made uh, uh, based on Apogee and Gaia, and, and, and then discuss why uh, uh, you know, we believe the Milky Way, we believe we found evidence that the Milky Way is not typical, and then quickly discuss, uh, quickly present our conclusions. Um, so this talk, uh, uh, I'm going to, because I'm, I'm talking about a number of different uh, results. It's going to be a little bit uh, devoid of technical detail, uh, but uh, you know, I hope that we'll have enough time to discuss those uh, uh, afterwards. Okay, right, so um, first part, galactic archaeology. Why galactic archaeology? I mean, I think that I'm preaching to the choir here, but let's remember, let's remind ourselves here of what, uh, what is the raison d'etre of galactic archaeology. The foundational question of galactic archaeology is what is the current structure of the Milky Way, and by structure, I mean distribution in, in multi-dimensional parameter space, not only structure as in morphology, 
but we are talking about the distribution of the cell population of the Milky Way in, in, in chemical space, in kinematic space, in age space, right? So um, besides uh, morphology in itself. The other question is therefore, what, what was the history leading up to it? Was the physical history, the physical processes that led up to the Milky Way being what it is? And third, uh, uh, the third question is, what does that teach us about galaxy formation? We want to use the Milky Way to constrain uh, galaxy formation theory, but that can only be done in a, in a strong way if the Milky Way is a typical galaxy. If the Milky Way is an outlier at the two, three sigma level, then the constraints that it, that it brings to galaxy formation theory are relatively weak because it's not uh, an average galaxy. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, now, why the halo? We want to study the halo because the halo holds a record of the Milky Way accretion history. Why? Because the Milky Way has a long, uh, so because the halo has a, a practically long dynamical time scales. So the, the, uh, uh, the accretion events tend to, to leave uh, a lasting mark footprints in the, in the distribution of stars on the sky, right? So you can see here on the left, you know, the results of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey that reviewed the presence of various streams here uh, uh, that, that are related to, to relatively recent accretion events. And the same happens on the right here in the case of M31, where you see that when you, when you survey the, the halo of the Milky deep, M31 deeply, you see similar streams and, 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 and uh, structure there. Now, the accretion history is a fundamental basic prediction of, uh, of uh, a consequence of lambda CDM and a prediction of cosmological numerical simulations. Therefore, it is critical that we use systems for which accretion history is, is, can be measured uh, 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 in detail uh, uh, to constrain that field. Uh, uh, now, early accretion is much harder because uh, of phase mixing. So uh, uh, while relatively recent accretion events, accretion events that have happened in, uh, a few billion years ago or are still happening, they leave this, the, these footprints here. When you go to earlier accretion events, it's more, it's more difficult because of phase mixing. So you have to, to try to, uh, 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 to use other uh, measurements to spot them, in particular uh, 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 chemistry and, and, and kinematics. And that, of course, was made possible by the advent of Gaia and, and various massive spectroscopic surveys. And that opened the door to a very large number of, of discoveries. Of course, initially, we already have even before Gaia uh, the discovery of the Sagittarius Dwarf and Helmi Stream, but, but since Gaia uh, came on, uh, lots of, of further discoveries have been made. There's the Gaia cell the sausage, which is probably the most uh, impacting recent discovery. Then Sequoia, Thumnus, uh, there was a prediction for the Kraken. And uh, if you just follow the literature, you'll see there's lots and lots of, of uh, indications of the possible occurrence of various accretion events. Right. But this is all in, in the outer, relatively outer halo, right? The halo beyond five kiloparsecs away from the galactic center. What about the inner few kiloparsecs of the halo? We have very little access to it, right? So why is that important? Well, first, roughly half of the halo mass is of this important thing that people very seldom talk about. Half of the halo mass is located within the inner few kiloparsecs of the Milky Way, okay? Second, uh, uh, the uh, numerical simulations predict that the, the earliest accreted events, uh, uh, in, particular the more, in particular the most massive ones, were driven there by, uh, uh, by dynamical friction and, and stay there. Uh, third, theoretical predictions tell us that the, the oldest stars in the Milky Way inhabit that region of the of the uh, um, of the halo. So it's a, we have many many reasons to to target the, the inner halo. Uh, uh, uh. However, uh, the inner halo. When we talk about inner halo, we talk about a region that is located within ten to fifteen degrees off of the galactic center. And we call that the bulge, right? So uh, by convention, uh, even though we don't even know whether the Milky Way has a classical bulge, probably not, uh, but it's a region that's characterized by high extinction and, 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 and very high crowding. So the halo, which is a very thin, a very low density uh, stellar component is, is vastly outnumbered by uh, the more metal rich populations, including the thin disk, the thick disk and the, and the bar. Right, so that's where apogee 
enters the the history, the story. Uh, uh, the Apogee is the Apache Point Observatory Galactic Evolution Experiment. I think that you all have probably heard of that before. It's the the only uh, um, uh, survey of the stellar population of the of the Milky Way spectroscopic survey that uh, is dual hemisphere, so we had access to all sky and uh, and therefore all components of the Milky Way. So I'm not going to go into much detail about the technical specs of Apogee. Uh, I want you to just keep in mind that. What makes Apogee different is that it's high resolution, so it provides uh, a precision uh, uh, abundances and radio velocities at high signal to noise as well. It's near infrared, therefore it gets access to all of the galactic components, and in particular access to the to the inner inner uh, parts of the of the galaxy, the low latitude uh, uh, the low latitude Milky Way, and uh, uh, includes uh, uh, over seven hundred thousand uh, uh, giant stars. So very large sample. So you sample in a statistically significant fashion uh, uh, all the, the components of the galaxy. Right, so just to give a visual uh, um, impression of what is Apogee. This is a plot here of, I just selected a bunch of stars in Apogee that, that meet uh, a given uh, uh, range of temperatures so that the, the abundances are, 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 are trustworthy signal to noise and so on, regardless of where these stars are. And you can see here, there's a lot of structure uh, uh, in, the, in this diagram. So this is the, the famous, the, 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 the well-known magnesium iron against iron. So it's alpha iron against metallicity, right? So uh, this is aluminum, which is pr produced uh, predominantly by, uh, partly by supernova type two, but also by uh, uh, AGB stars, carbon nitrogen, also AGB stars. Magnesium over manganese. This is a, 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 um, a plane that is used to to uh, highlight uh, possible accretive populations. So now you see a lot of substructure here, and I will just identify some of them here. Just to have, of course, the thick and the thin disk. They occupy different positions here in these various planes. Gaia Enceladus, uh, uh, the Magellanic Clouds, Fornax, Sagittarius. So you see that the, the, these uh, chemical planes have a tremendous discriminating power and they can be used to not only tag different populations, but also given the fact that they, 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 they sample uh, a, a wide range of nucleus, nucleus synthetic pathways, tell uh, uh, the, the history of star formation and chemical enrichment of these various systems. Right, but uh, uh, the focus here is the inner halo, right? So Apogee makes a big difference in the inner halo because for the first time ever, we have detailed chemistry for over 10,000 stars within three to four kiloparsecs of the Milky Way center. Never, never, we never had that before. And as you know, every time in astrophysics, when you, when you get a, a new, you get to uh, explore um, uncharted territory, there's a vast room for discovery there, and that's what happened. So when you combine these uh, precision, these, these uh, amazing detailed chemistry with precision distances in kinematics using Gaia, you have a very powerful tool there. So now, so see what happens when you transition from the whole sample to the, to the uh, inner halo. There is a lot of astrophysics going on here, just as we transition from one to the other here. And people are still like trying to scratch the surface and understand what's going on here. This is a beautiful field uh, and it's ev evolving very beautifully right now. Okay, so now uh, uh, the focus of the two discoveries that we have made here are shown quickly here. So the nitrogen rich stars, which are, uh, uh, we'll talk ab about uh, very soon in Heracles. Uh, um, what are those things? Okay, so first, the nitrogen rich stars. Uh, um, so we discovered with Apogee this population of uh, um, stars, giant stars, located within two kiloparsecs actually of the of the Milky Way center. They have uh, a chemistry that resembles that of galactic globular clusters, in particular the so-called second generation uh, uh, globular cluster stars. How is that? So if you look here at this plot, so this shows on top here, the nitrogen against carbon abundances and uh, uh, highlighted on the top here is just the, so these are all the, uh, the, the, the bulge field stars in that sample. Highlighted here, you see stars that 
follow this uh, um, anti-correlation, okay, um, between carbon and nitrogen, which is which is a characteristic of uh, second generation global cluster stars. Uh, to convince you of that, you see on the bottom panel here uh, cluster stars, global cluster stars from Apogee, and they occupy the same the same uh, uh, locus here as uh, the nitrogen rich stars, and uh, uh, in particular here highlighting the second generation population. Which, which is present in both, uh, in both panels here. But the, the thing is, these are field stars, they're not cluster stars. Therefore, the question is, what are they doing in the field? Well, you could, you could imagine that, oh, they, they, they were just lost to clusters because clusters evaporate, therefore they belong to the galactic global cluster that we know, uh, uh, but they were lost to those clusters as they travel through the, the, the inner parts of the galaxy, no. That's not the case. As you see here, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the MDF, the metallist distribution function. First of the bulge, right, at the top, and in the middle is the, uh, the, the MDF of the nitrogen-rich population. In the bottom here, the MDF of uh, uh, the galactic global cluster system, and they differ statistically uh, uh, in a very statistically significant fashion. There, there is no way that you can uh, uh, extract an MDF such as that of the nitrogen rich stars from the MDF of the existing global cluster system. Okay, so the, the conclusion therefore is that these, this population results from the complete destruction of global clusters. An early population of global clusters was destroyed and we see the remnants of it there. There are theoretical predictions for this going uh, uh, dating all the way back to the, the 70s. Okay, so now, Right, so uh, um, now a more recent result, we, we, we looked for these stars in other parts of the galaxy, right? And we looked for these stars in other galaxies. So what you see here is a, a, a plot of uh, uh, here, the energy angular momentum plane, integrals of motion, right? So this is, uh, I'm going to go over this in more detail later. Suffice it for you to know now that this blob here that you see in the very middle, this green blob, is Gaia Enceladus, right, which is a population uh, uh, of uh, uh, very uh, low rotation and high energy. And uh, uh, on the right here, where you see the velocity, the rotational velocity against the radial velocity, uh, again, Gaia Enceladus here now is uh, in this purplish color here. This is, this is why it's called the sausage because of the, the distribution, uh, uh, elongated distribution here because of the very high dispersion in the radial velocity component. And you see that there are lots and lots of the black dots here are nitrogen rich stars. So there are nitrogen rich stars. There are destroyed globular clusters in Gaia Enceladus. Okay, they have the same, uh, the same uh, uh, kinematics as Gaia Enceladus. And of course, there are those stars also located along the, the, the thick disk. So there are some of these stars that, 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 re, that were formed in the, gal the galaxy and remained here. Uh, uh, but there are no, and we looked for those in, we have, as we, as we have seen, we have data for the Magellanic Clouds, we have data for the Sagittarius Dwarf, we have data for Fornex, we have data for a number of dwarf satellites of the Milky Way, and we find, found none of these stars in any of those. Although this is a preliminary result, uh, we will go with it right now and stay with me. So what's the conclusion here? So we find this large population, uh, it is heavily concentrated towards the, 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 the central part of the, of the halo. Uh, uh, we measured this and the, 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 the frequency of these stars is much higher by an order of magnitude in the central parts of the halo than in the outer parts of the halo. So we estimated a mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses of these this of, of destroyed globular clusters within the few, uh, few kiloparsecs of the Milky Way halo. And uh, 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 we did didn't find any satellites, but we do find them in Gaia Enceladus. We estimate that 30% of those stars that are located within the bulge are accreted. They have, a, they have the chemistry of an accreted system. So uh, uh, the bottom line then is that they seem to be related to accretion to some extent. Okay? All right. So uh, next discovery. So the galaxy within the galaxy, this is the, uh, the, the, the press release picture that we have uh, 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 um, associated with this discovery. Uh, uh, let's see what this is. So this is, uh, 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 we started from a parent population. Uh, you have seen this plot before. This is again, the, the famous alpha iron against iron plane. 
you have you see here the the thick disc the thin disc Guy and cellulose is here in the in the in the lower magnesium lower metallicity region. So when you look at these stars in the in the uh, uh, integrals of motion plane energy against uh, against uh, uh, angular momentum, you see this distribution. So this is the entire population being shown here. So as I said before, this blob that you see in the middle is Guy and cellulose, right? And the distribution has this shape here, this V shape. Essentially, because at a given amount of energy, you can only have so much angular momentum, right? Otherwise, you just fly away. So uh, uh, the bottom line then is that uh, as what you see this this big uh, uh, concentration here along this leg of the V here is just the, the disk of the galaxy, right? It's a very big structure. So what is in the, therefore what's in the right here is prograde, what's in the left is retrograde, which is like on the top here is high energy, therefore less bound, low energy, very, very much bound. All right, so what happens then when we look at these populations in this plane here, where you see, it's been shown before that accreted populations or, or populations that have a, 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 a very uh, immature chemical enrichment, okay? So they tend to lie in this region here that we call accreted, Whereas uh, populations that are more evolved chemically are located in this area. This is the in situ, high alpha and in situ low alpha populations. And you can see here, and so in, in, in the, the 2D histogram is the entire sample, whereas in, in the, the, the red the dots here uh, are the populations just within uh, four kiloparsecs off of the galactic center. Not, notice that it, this is a clumpy distribution. Right, so uh, uh, you know we 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 do draw a line here to uh, uh, to separate these populations in, in terms of accreted and in situ, but uh, 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 the data themselves uh, show uh, uh, a split here because of the clumpy distribution. Okay, right. So what happens then when you move from the parent sample to the accreted sample? It becomes very clumpy here as well. So again, then you highlight here. Uh, Guy Enceladus, which is you know very 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 prominent, and in the bottom here at low energy you have also uh, some substructure here, and that's what we call Heracles. So this is uh, our interpretation: is this this is a, 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 um, uh, the remnants of a, of a galaxy, a ten to the eight solar mass galaxies, ten to the eight, three times ten to the eight solar mass galaxies, uh, uh, so, so, uh, three times time to three times 10 to the eight solar masses galaxy, sorry, that uh, was uh, likely accreted to the Milky Way uh, very early before Gaia Selge. So let's see the arguments in that direction. First, chemical detachment. We can model the distribution of these populations in chemical planes as a superposition of Gaussians with no, uh, um, with no bridge connecting them. Uh, uh, so we, you don't re really actually need to evolve chemically between, between the lowest metallicity population, which is where Heracles is located, and the thick disk. Second, when you compare the, the, the kinematic properties, the orbital properties of these populations with their, uh, uh, their co-located counterparts, they differ in statistically significant ways in all planes. So the, either uh, uh, vertical action, energy, radio action, and angular momentum. So assuming then that this is indeed the case, uh, uh, and we have some, some, some strong arguments uh, uh, coming out, out of numerical simulations that would predict such systems to indeed exist, um, uh, we can look at, a comparison between this system and the better known system, which is Gaia Enceladus. So in this plot here, you see uh, um, the Heracles, which we use called IGS, the in inner galaxy structure, and in blue, Gaia Enceladus. What's the big difference here between these two distributions? Even though they are selected chemically in the same way, right? Although there is some contamination here, you can see in the case of Heracles, which is unavoidable. So while Gaia Enceladus has the characteristic, you can see here there's the, the, the plateau, the knee and the shin, you can see that Gaia Enceladus has a prominent shin, the Gaia Enceladus sausage, um, the Heracles does not. Heracles does not have the, the, the prolonged 
uh, uh, um, shin, which is where you, you, you gain uh, um, enrichment supernova type 1A, which causes this drop here in the formation of the knee. Right, so um, that means that uh, chemical evolution was, was uh, quenched. Star formation in the form of chemical evolution was stopped early. Okay, so to conclude the second discovery, the, the, the summary of the second discovery, we find evidence for this remnant of a satellite accretion, which have been likely at, at a high redshift. Uh, uh, the mass that we that we that we estimate, sorry, I said three. It's five times ten to the eight solar masses, uh, uh, based on, on on its chemistry. So roughly twice the mass of the Gaia Enceladus system. It it uh, uh, accounts for between a fourth and a third of the metal poor bond. So uh, uh, there are other possible scenarios, but we rule them out to some degree. Right, it could be the core of Gaia Enceladus, but that doesn't match some aspects aspects of the, uh, uh, of, the, um, of the data. And it could be also a, a result of a fully in situ formation. We cannot rule it out completely, although uh, uh, Occam's razor speaks in, in, in favor of um, this being the remnant of an accretion system. Okay, right. So now, so let's now get all of this here and, 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 and keep this in mind. And go to the third part of the talk, where uh, 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 of the of the science part of the talk, of the non-introductory part of the talk, where we look at the Milky Way uh, uh, and ask the question: Is this common? There are many ways of trying uh, trying to address this problem, right? All of them are very difficult. So we decided to uh, address that uh, uh, using cosmological numerical simulations. How did we do that? So first thing is, let's look at the, this feature of the Milky Way disk called the alpha bimodality, right? So what is this? At constant metallicity, I apologize that the, the, the label here is, uh, is uh, cut off. So at a given F E on H, at a given metallicity, you have two populations with different alpha variety. This is extremely hard to, to produce based on, on single zone, uh, uh, one zone, uh, Came conclusion model. People have to resort to ad hoc uh, assumptions in order to explain that. Now, this is like that in the solar neighborhood, and it's like that everywhere. The galaxy, except perhaps for the, the very innermost part of the, of, the, of the disk, it's all over the place, characterized by this bimodality. So if you fine tune the parameters to match the, 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 the distribution of these populations in the solar neighborhood, you have to fine tune them elsewhere. So that's not a satisfactory explanation. So uh, what we did was we asked ourselves, uh, uh, do cosmological numerical simulations produce galaxies like this, right? So I'm going to cut a very long story short here to tell you that yes, they do, but only 5% of Milky Way-like galaxies in the biggest uh, uh, eagle volume that we could uh, uh, study show that. And uh, 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 what sets these 5% of these galaxies apart from the rest of the Milky Way-like galaxies? It is the accretion history. So this plot here shows the, the uh, evolution of the, of the virial mass, total mass, dark matter mass, right? Uh, of, uh, of galaxies in the Eagle simulation as a function of time, right? And then the blue here shows all disks, okay? And in red, you see the only the galaxies which do have a bimodal, uh, a bimodal um, uh, uh, alpha disk. And you see here that uh, the big difference is that the galaxies with, with the big with, with the bimodal disk they they undergo an accretion history which is more active in the in the earlier stages than the galaxies that don't have the bimodal disk. So. That means then that the Milky Way is somehow different from the uh, other Milky Way mass counterparts um, at the, the two sigma level. So then we go back then to the question that we posed is as to whether the Milky Way is a typical galaxy. 
So when we ask that question, we should ask that question in terms of according to which property, right? You, you have to, it has to be asked, uh, uh, the property that we use to define uh, uh, commonality needs to be a property that is important uh, uh, um, in determining uh, um, what makes a galaxy a galaxy. So uh, uh, in the accretion history is by all means a fundamental parameter determining the way the stars and the gas in a galaxy are organized today. So, and we are finding here that the Milky Way has an accretion history that uh, 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 was very intense in the past. And uh, uh, this goes along what I have been just telling you about in the first part of the talk, where we find evidence in the inner Milky Way halo of very intense early accretion history in the form of Heracles, in the form of all those nitrogen rich uh, populations indicating the presence of destroyed global clusters there. So uh, 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 this all brings it together to say that the Milky Way may be unusual, which brings us to Copernicus. Copernicus has uh, 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 provoked a revolution when, uh, when he found out, proposed that the, 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 the Earth was not the center of the universe. The sun is, was the center of the universe. The revolution then you know, was that, okay, so now, now we no longer occupy a place of prominence, of relevance in the universe. This has uh, uh, a tenet, a principle. So we assume question by the data. And uh, uh, we are here for the first time providing evidence that, uh, uh, in fact, this assumption may, may not uh, uh, be entirely true. Okay, so conclusions then. Uh, uh, as I said, so we analyzed the largest ever sample of precision detailed chemistry uh, in, in 3D kinematics for the inner halo. We suggest that there is a, a, the presence of the remnants of a massive accretion event, uh, which we call the uh, uh, Heracles, uh, roughly twice the mass of the sausage. Uh, um, we also find this large population of destroyed global clusters, which is likely associated with accretion as well. And uh, this intense early accretion of, that the Milky Way seems to have undergone uh, uh, may set it apart from other Milky Way-like galaxies at the two sigma level. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. And uh, we all uh, congratulate you with uh, your discoveries and uh, thank you for sharing uh, with some um, up, uh, unpublished uh, your, your results. Thank you. So Bye -bye. now we have some time uh, for questions. Who has questions? Please uh, unmute and ask. So far, people are preparing. Uh, I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, you investigate quite metal deficient stars, uh, uh, which. Uh, Nitrogen features you use, and uh, you know that in giant, giants there are mixing uh, processes right. going, and uh, there should be also carbon determined uh, oxygen in order to have uh, uh, proper <laughs> results of all those three elements. Uh, do you investigate uh, those other elements? And, yes. Uh, so. Excellent question, thank you very much. So let me, let me find here a plot uh, uh, from the paper that uh, addresses that question uh, uh, while, uh, just a second. The nice uh, uh, aspect of uh, giving a talk uh, online is that you can resort to the stuff in your computer <laughs> for quick uh, help. Right, so, uh, uh, right, so, 
I will share the screen now um, again. Okay, so right. So this here, uh, uh, what we are looking at here is uh, at, um, so this is, uh, 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 look at the, the, so uh, the, the upper panels. So far we do not panel. see. So far we do not okay. see your plots. You, you, you do not see? Oh. Now, now we see. Oh, you see? Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so, right, so, um, the top panel and the second panel show the spectrum of uh, uh, two stars. One, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, gray one is the one that's nitrogen rich and the, uh, uh, the uh, black one is nitrogen normal, okay? And they are picked so that carbon over iron and oxygen are more about the same. So CO lines are very similar. Right in this two spectra, as you would expect, right? The CO lines are indicated here by these ticks. Same about OH lines. That shows you that these stars have are very close in carbon and oxygen, okay? Because both OH and CO match. Temperatures are the same, of course. When you have 100,000 stars, it's very easy to find stars that match, right? So, uh, temperature, so temperature is the same, surface gravity is the same, metallist is the same, uh, microturbulent velocity is the same, okay? Now look at the night, the CN lines now. The CN lines differ very strongly, okay? So, uh, uh, so that, 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 that ascertains the, the nitrogen rich nature of these stars. Now, uh, obviously, as you point out, you have to, to, to mind uh, the fact that the nitrogen evolves due to mixing, right? And so, but, which is why we, we, we do these comparisons always at the same position in the HR diagram. We get to select stars with the same temperature, same, same, same gravity, and same metallicity, right? And so, and, and of course, we have the globular clusters, right, uh, as, a, as, a, uh, um, as a backup, because the phenomenon is known to exist in globular clusters. And you see, so when, when you plot, for instance, nitrogen against surface gravity, right, you see that these populations, they are the same surface gravity, but very different nitrogen, so. So, very good approach. Very good thank approach. You, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's so we there. have uh, two uh, more questions. I, where are those hands? Uh, Avray. Who Avery is Avray? Yeah. Av Avery, or I don't know how to pronounce. Hi. Hi. Hi, Ricardo. Yes. Thank you. That that was quite interesting. I I, I have a question on the on the interpretation. Uh, so it's been postulated for a long time that we're seeing only a minority of the original globular clusters. That many have been lost within the galaxy. Um, I, I don't know how well modeled that has been in the past, but. How does the mass that you're finding compare, first of all, just with the present population of globular clusters? And, and um, can you comment on, on agreement with models? Right, okay, this is, a, this is a fascinating question. Thank you very much. So um, if our numbers are right, <laughs> if our numbers are right, the mass that we infer in destroyed globular clusters out numbers, the mass of existing global clusters by a factor of six to eight, okay? Now, I, I am not going to resort to, to the models to discuss that. I'm going to go to the data, okay? So what have we here? Uh, let me just, uh, uh, I, hope you, I hope you can see the, uh, um, the, uh, this plot here, okay? So as you know, the, the, the mass of a global cluster system the, the integrated mass of all global clusters is one of the best indicators of the total mass of a galaxy, right? This has been shown uh, by uh, different groups. This is a paper here by Mike Hudson and collaborators. Where, what you see here is uh, uh, stellar mass, okay, on, uh, on, the, on the left, col left uh, column and uh, uh, the halo mass in the right column. And, uh, um, and uh, so, and the, uh, Plotted here is the, the mass of globular clusters. Let's focus here on the, on the bottom panels. The mass of the total mass of the global cluster system divided by the mass of the halo, okay? 
And, uh, 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 and the question is, where does the Milky Way stand in this diagram with, the cur with its current globular cluster system? Okay, is it normal or is it off? Wait a second. Big, okay, okay, yeah, okay, sorry. All right, so I placed it here because, uh, 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 okay, so if, so there's an uncertainty here, which is, which pertains to, uh, we don't know very well the mass of the halo, the total mass of the halo, the Milky Way. This needs to be a little bit updated, right? But uh, taking the current estimates of the, of the, the, of the current, I mean, by 2018, pre-Gaia, DR2, okay? Uh, uh, the mass, the estimates of the mass of the halo of the Milky Way, uh, it could be, the Milky Way could be very central in that relation or very off, right? Uh, uh, um, so say, let's say if the Milky Way is off by over one sigma, right? So then that means that this, this, they, it formed as a normal galaxy, you know, and then destroyed this cluster very efficiently, more efficiently than, than other galaxies. Possibly, possibly, I'm just, I can only speculate here because of this crazy accretion history that it underwent, you know, in the very uh, um, early stages of its history. Okay, but let's now assume that this, this uh, halo mass is this one here, right? A higher, sorry, a lower halo mass, right? So then the Milky Way is dead on center of the relation. Then the implication is that all galaxies have destroyed global clusters very efficiently which then would mean that uh, uh, global clusters uh, are a main, an important means of star formation uh, 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 in the universe. Right, that, yeah, that's, that's nice. Uh, I've seen the recent estimate for the halo mass where I was actually putting it down to the lower, lower value and that puzzled the astronomers. So that's actually quite enlightening. Um, but that might actually help explain the globular cluster population. All right, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Very, very nice question. I appreciate it. So now, uh, Douglas uh, Geisler, you can ask. Hi, Ricardo. Hi, Good to see you. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, uh, fantastic data set, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, I'm sure there's lots more interesting things coming out. Uh, I suppose I could ask you if you're working, what you're working on, but uh, I'll ask you about um, the globular clusters as well. Um, maybe you just answer the question, but uh, you know, the, if you look at the inner halo bulge today, there, there's a number of metal poor clusters, uh, you know, roughly half of them, uh, I think are below minus 0.8 in metallicity. And isn't it possible that uh, a significant fraction of your nitrogen rich stars might have come from, from those clusters and you don't need a, a, a large number of destroyed ones or, the, or, or are the numbers just too large? Just you, you need too many of them. Right, okay. So uh, I, I know that the, you guys are discovering new clusters every day, right? <laughs> so I will be very careful here. So this is the, the, the information that we had uh, back in uh, 2017, right? Uh, 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 I don't know by how much it changed. I mean, I think that we have a handful of new candidates, right? So uh, uh, the question here is, so if you look at the MDF of the nitrogen rich stars, right? It, uh, uh, it peaks where there is a trough in the MDF of the existing global cluster system, minus one-ish, right? So, uh, 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 now the thing is, this has changed a bit, right? We have more data, right? And it uh, needs to be reassessed. Uh, one of my students have done that uh, uh, recently, it showed it Kisco, and the, the, the difference remains. Uh, okay. uh, um, now we know, so uh, uh, also show bit. Uh, so let me show you something, something else here, just since we are there uh, um, and we have time, uh, let me see where, where is it now. Uh, all right, there's a slide here. Like this. So, um, oh, sorry, I have to uh, um, um, skip the slide and I'm going to skip this one too. So, uh, right. So, if you look, so this is again the population of nitrogen rich stars on top of uh, uh, the, um, the, the bulge populations, right? So, uh, in the silicon iron plane, right? And you see here that uh, there's quite a few of them that, that live in the accreted region of, the, of this plot. So um, this, you know, we estimate 30% of, of them, of the, those stars are accreted. Uh, uh, 
the others, they were formed in the disk of the Milky Way. Now, there is this whole like, you know, cruel cradle effect that people claim uh, explain uh, the very efficient destruction of global clusters in a turbulent disk in the early history of the galaxy. So uh, 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 the MDF of this, the, this is not important thing. So if, if you think that this population of, um, of uh, 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 in situ and which stars uh, is associated with a thick disk and uh, with, then the MDF would match and it doesn't match and it's probably because the, thick, the, the disk forms stars after uh, these stars were, these clusters were destroyed or the stars were lost to the cluster. So it's a longer story there. We're still scratching the surface, basically. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you, now you here show the sharp mark uh, which stars are in situ, which are accreted, accreted. So, however, we think that uh, the thick disk of the galaxy may be also <laughs> uh, accreted. So what can you say about that? Right. Okay, that brings a, a, a different paper altogether. So um, let me go here back to, is it here? No, it's, it's further down. Here. Actually, we do not know very well the formation history, of course, of the thick disk. Uh, <laughs> right. But still. Okay. So when we are talking about the, the, the bimodality of the disk, right, where the, the, the high alpha disk, which, is, which maps uh, in, in real world maps, um, mostly to the high, uh, to the uh, um, high scale high disk, right? So uh, uh, the thick disk, um, it, uh, um, I was going to say, so this is the, so why I recall that we looked at the, the, the you know, when we looked at the, the Eagle simulations, we looked for, you know, uh, 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 the origin of the systems, right? Of the low alpha and the high alpha disk. Because I said, 5% of the galaxies are by model, right? Only 5%, as I said, like the Milky Way. So now, what is the origin of this thing? So as you know, right, people have uh, historically uh, uh, resorted to, to uh, uh, models that uh, in, in some ad hoc contorted ways, try to, to make evolution go, you form first a thick disk, then you go down, and uh, via a second infall and then, and then form the thin disk, right? So uh, what we find is that these alpha rich and alpha poor populations, right? When you look at them, they evolved in complete chemical detachment. So our proposition for this, and this is very, we discussed this in very much detail in this paper led by Ted Macro, Macro, sorry, Macro, <laughs> sorry, Ted Macro. Uh, um, so these are systems that evolved in complete detachment. Uh, um, so as, the, as the, 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 the initial stages of star formation are taking place in the Milky Way, you're forming you know, uh, these systems in, 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 in probably massive clumps, right? That, that eventually uh, coalesce into the center of the galaxy uh, with some different amounts of angular momentum because the, 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 the they uh, merge at different times. So, um, but the bottom line is, uh, uh, the, we are talking about a stage here where the Milky Way is largely accreting itself, right? So where you have uh, um, massive clumps forming and, 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 and converging uh, uh, and, and collapsing together, within the, the major uh, host halo. And uh, maybe the thick disk is just one of them, right? And, and it, it must have evolved very quickly because it's so well mixed. So, but yeah, I don't know if it's accreted, right? Accreted is a, 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 a you know, at this stage, right? Uh, there, there might be a difference between accreted as in the sense of, of a, a system that, that formed all its stars uh, earlier you know, outside the, the, the potential well of the, uh, of the Milky Way halo, and then got accreted or something that uh, uh, a system that uh, is forming stars as it, as it collapses toward the, uh, 
the halo of the nuclei. So, I mean, I, I think that it becomes hard to distinguish those phenomena very early in, this, in, the, in the evolution. Okay, so, <clears throat> thank you. We have uh, a question by Federico Simone uh, Romero. Uh, and uh, yeah. the question is, uh, is it possible to find a, an open cluster in the halo that belongs to another galaxy? Well, it, uh, I, don't th I don't see why that would not be possible. Uh, um, I just don't think that has ever happened. There have been claims, I think, uh, in the literature of the high latitude, discovery of high latitude O B stars, but I, I don't know how credible they are. Uh, in principle, you know, um, nothing prevents you from finding it, right? So uh, Gaia now has a fairly, a fairly good uh, um, um, account of the star populations within very large volume of the of the halo so we should be able to see those uh, uh the you know the, the thing is if it's an open cluster right uh let's think here would an open cluster survive uh, um um an accretion event right uh, um depending upon the ebbing say a, a, a young open cluster did you say open cluster was a, a young open cluster like you know, you know a few mega years probably impossible because I don't think there's a, a record of anything being accreted uh, to the galaxy as such a, 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 so recently. If it's a one giga year thing, then uh, I would say the same. Uh, if it is uh, uh, older than, in principle, yes, but I don't think anything, not, not, nothing like that has been identified yet. Okay, so we will wait for this discovery. Yeah. So thank you very much, Ricardo, for your presentation. And, uh, you. and I encourage uh, other scientists also to propose the talks and uh, see you the next time. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Virginia. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Vako. Thank you.